Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Weekly. Couldn't tell you the number, but today is October 30th, 2011. And my name is Jennifer Madrill, and I'm sitting in Chicago, Illinois. Dave Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. This is John Schenker in Stowe, Ohio. Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, where it's October 31st. Are we ready oh. for a special spooky Ooh. edition of EdTech Weekly? Uh, yes. yes, I think we are. We're going to so scare Jane, everybody with. Big topic today. Yes, the topic. Um, Firefox keeps freezing on me, so I unfortunately cannot drop any links in, in the chat room. Um, but our topic today is continuing our Change 2011 theme and having a, let's call it a study group on the current week's topic. Um, it was on open educational resources. And. Um, I don't know, like without having the ability to open any links, I'm going completely from memory right now. Um, so maybe someone could help me out with some links, and I can't open anything. Please, please. I think you're doing fine, just, Jen. Just keep it up. <laughs> just, keep, just keep on going. Uh, and the reason I, I wanted to talk about it, I, I think I would. Uh, I was trying to explain it to the uh, the guys before we started. I love it when my big internet collides with my little internet and so I started digging into the resources and looking at some of the recordings from the past week and lo and behold there was Dave dominating the conversation on Tuesday's session shockingly and then um, there's an upcoming meeting in November um, I believe it was November 9th and 10th if I could get my link I could confirm that uh, and they're having an open educational resources university um, continuation of their discussion of how that whole process is going to take shape in 2011 or 2012 rather um, and Jeff Lebo was on the list of virtual participants as well as Dave Cormier so again my big internet collided with my little internet so Dave tell us what you thought as a participant it, it, in the live session in my defense, I was actually a host of the live session, so there was some reason for oh. me to be talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was monopolizing in my role as a facilitator for that course. Just, just um, to clarify, at one point George said you were being antagonistic and provocative. <laughs> just, just to clarify, I which is down. pretty much ad, ad, as advertised. I'm, it, I, and then it, no, no, no shock there. No and then at another to point, or anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and another point in the conversation, George said, "If my uh, my argument, if you let me finish, Dave, is," <laughs> and then he proceeded to describe his uh, his position. So. Um, one of the things that comes up around the whole OER, the OER debate generally is, and we had the same kind of discussion on Friday in the open session, is how do we make sure that that one, that people are being assessed, two, that people know where they fit inside the structure, and three, that we know what value each one of the OER things actually has, right? And I think it's mostly gobbledygook to, be, to begin with. But George will take that a step further and say that any time we attach any kind of structure in measurement, in this case he was talking about badges, and should we apply badges, like I have the, um, I don't know, OER economics badge, meaning that I've gone through the first 10 OERs in the accepted OER economics thingy. A good example is, again, what happens at the Khan Academy where you have energy points that you get based on what you watch and how much you watch and whether or not you answer the questions and the stuff and they all start to add up. And then you have a ranking that you can sort of compare against other, other people and, and use in terms of status. And what George will say is that those just lead to people getting the badges for badges sake. And what I will say is, how exactly is that different from anything else we do? That's exactly uh, I, I, what I, credits are. J just to fulfill my role of what you're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. can we define some terms? <laughs> We're talking about O-E-R-U. -R. What is O-E-R? Uh, O-E-R um, is all we were talking about so far. Uh, O-E-R is an open educational resource. And OERU is the Open Educational Resource University, which is being set up by Wayne McIntosh and a bunch of other folks and is hopefully launching in 2012. Now, with Open Educational Resource, OER, are we putting those in capitals? Are we talking about a specific blessed thing that we're calling an Open Educational Resource? Or is any resource that's appropriate and openly available online in OER? Well, it entirely and, depends on who you talk to. It depends on who you're talking to. As far as um, the Open Educational Resource University, at this point, um, they're talking about it being uh, 
anything. However, when you start parsing things and talking about how they're actually going to function, uh, there's a huge emphasis on assessment and accrediting someone's experience for, um, or giving them credit for their experience. And then the conversation in Tuesday's session turned to, oh, so you're saying we're going to be creating resources specific to a test. Uh, which then the conversation took a little bit different turn. So I would encourage anyone who is interested in this topic at all to listen to Tuesday's session, uh, which is in the link I just put in um, in the chat room. But that was my take. Dave, what was yours different from, from you actually participated much more than I did this week? No, I think that's fair. I, it's, they are the same circles we have been navigating around for years around this topic, and that's whether or not it's just how much structure do we need to put in there? And then the next question becomes, if they're open educational resources and if people can go and read them and watch them whenever they want to, what exactly is a university? And what exactly are we doing outside of that? Is it just a place where essentially some dude who we vaguely trust says that I read those things? Like, is that all it really breaks down to at some point? And obviously places like Athabasca would like to say that it's more than that. Um, because if all a university is is a place where people check to see if you've read something, then um, the private sector is going to do an awful lot better job setting up some kind of accreditation system than you know than you're going to get from a university which has researchers and professors and a whole bunch of other people on salaries that the private sector can beat handily, you know. And um, and just to step. Um, and we're kind of, we are kind of, Jeff, to your, to your point, jumping around a little bit. Uh, Rory came on to speak about open educational resources, but really most of his week, at least of what I saw, was he's very much involved in the kickoff for the Open Educational Resources University. And so much of his conversation centered around that. And so I just put a link in the chat room. It's a paper that stemmed from, I believe it was back in February in New Zealand, they had their first kickoff meeting and they attempted to diagram what this university would look like. And so I just dumped a, a PDF in the chat room, which I think, can you guys open that? Might help our conversation a little bit. Um, because it, it lays out a model of what they're talking about. And um, just to jump right in with a critique, it's something thing, again, we've talked about a lot. Lots of conversations sur surrounding resources that are out there. Lots of talk about how to credit people's experience. And what I think tends to be missing from the conversation is the middle part, which I think is the most important part, which is the actual, I term it instruction, you can talk, call it the learning that occurs, whatever you want to call it in air quotes. Um, but I still don't, I'm not clear exactly how that is to happen, other than maybe people sit at their desks and read the resources. <laughs> Did you get any take on that part, Dave, from the conversation? No. No, and I don't think that um, as you are... Uh, Miss PhD almost person. My badge. Uh, would, would, yeah, My latest you, badge. That's right. That's right. Um, would know far better than I. Um, there's a fair amount of disagreement on what that little middle part you refer to is. Right. Um, and it's an awful lot easier in this debate to skip over it and just say, <laughs> yeah. oh, we have these resources and we're going to accredit them. Right. Um, and, and that that middle part where I think all of the important things happen because I don't particularly care about the content and I don't the credit, the accreditation is not important to me as an educator. It's important to me in my role as a person who works for universities, but not for educationally. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's fuzzy business because if it's just acquiring content, if that's the only thing we're doing, is you know routing people to a list of content, then the university doesn't really exist in any way that's recognizable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it's that middle part that is what the university is. It's the experience of learning. You know? So what do we suggest? Well, there are lots of ways to and then you get into the whole discussion of what is instruction and what is learning and um, I think they're leaving it up to kind of bring your own instruction or bring your own learning and John, maybe it's a good time for you to kind of talk about how you're getting credit for your experience for the MOOC and well, yeah, how I, does I, that work out? A couple thoughts. One, one first taking this to the K-12 level is that that middle step is one that's missing in a lot of places. I have a daughter who's in an online school and their focus is entirely on providing her with content and there's the teacher's 
job, I guess, and, and we haven't really quite even figured this out yet, I think is to, to, man, to monitor her progress, but not to actually provide any kind of instruction at all, which is very different from what we were expecting. So, you know, they sort of skip over that, that part of just, you know, doing any of the education piece. They just say, here's the content, and then at the end, here's the assessment. And if, you know, by this point in the year, you're 25% of the way through the content and have mastered the assessments at an appropriate level, then you're doing great. And, you know, very little interaction between the student and the teacher and, and actual, you know, teaching or thinking yeah, or any of that stuff. So can you actually, let's, let's kind of take a second here. Can you take mm -hmm. us through what a typical week is for her then? Or if it, a longer period, if that's necessary. Like she gets some instructional material, you're saying, and then she's tested. So She gets what all the instructional in the materials <laughs> at, at the beginning of the year. So you know, at the beginning of the year, she got a pile of boxes. And they had textbooks in them. And they had lab materials for her science classes. And they had art materials for her art classes. And she got access to the online portal, and they just said, go to town. And there are assessments that are done online as part of each of the units. Um, and mom really is managing most of that and saying, this week we're going to focus on writing, or this week we're going to focus on social studies, and, and this is what we're going to study. We're going to read this chapter in the book, and then you're going to do um, these online activities, or you're going to participate in you know these these activities that are available and then at the end of that she's taking an online test and um, so she mainly she during passes the, day the so test oh sorry go ahead I was gonna, I was gonna ask so it, her day then is spent doing what reading and doing exercises or like lots what, of what, reading what? lots of reading lots of exercises they do have class connects where she is in an illuminate style session with a teacher um, class connects are optional and they're not interactive at all. It's just presenting content statically, if that makes any sense, um, where the students aren't allowed to talk to each other or to the teacher in the session. Speaking of talking to each other, Dave is having quite a engaged discussion with himself in the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh, have that window open. Let me, let me go check that I out. the bigger monitor. <laughs> Would you like to put some audio to your uh, inner... Oh. <laughs> in her uh, discussion, it's not that one. Well, I, I don't know who Dave's alter ego is. Um, <laughs> I have I have some suspicions, um, but uh, no, there's a there's a side discussion here, and it's more just sort of uh, approaching the the broader question of change. Actually, I think John's discussion is more interesting. I think the the link here is more broadly difficult in terms of when we're looking at education. And we have the same problem with the back to basics movement. Um, in um, in the K twelve system, right? The idea that somehow all we're trying to do is send in content. For anybody who heard my rant, <laughs> my heard my rant earlier uh, this week in El Kuros's class, you know, we got to ask ourselves what we're trying to train out of people. If we're just trying to give them content, that that seems a bit silly, as the content's already available. If it's mm -hmm. the approved content, then we're just normatizing people. I, I don't know, and it seems that with OERU. Uh, I don't know where they're going to go with that. If it's going to be, I mean, I wouldn't, you, you could say that the MOOC is the same thing, right? That all we're doing is presenting content. I think that it's a bit different than that. I think there are there are times and points in time where just putting the content out there and bringing a group together allows that group to do other things. You know, I don't know if that's happening with your daughter or not. Are there ways in which the no. kids are kind of combining in different ways? They're, they're, starting to build their own networks but it's difficult to do so because of the restrictions of the school like if they're in a class connect they're not allowed to exchange any kind of personal information with one another so they can't find each other outside of that experience so you know like my daughter's using google docs for everything so she's right she'll write an essay and then share it so that other people can comment on it but she can't share with any of her classmates because she doesn't have their email addresses and she can't ask them for them in a class connect because that's verboten because she's not they're not allowed to share personal information so it's just a really strange setup you know part of it i think is as an online charter they're catering to to the parents who want to isolate their kids and the reason they don't want to send them to the public school is because they don't want them to actually interact with anybody else um, 
and and so there's that element there that that we're protecting your kid by putting them in a box and we're trying to push through that and kind of push them in a direction that allows them to take advantage of the fact that they're in a building one to one environment and the kids have you know all of this ability to interact and to collaborate with one another and they're doing none of it so is she but enjoying her day does she enjoy what I mean she, it's kind of solitary and lonely actually <laughs> it is but she's she's very self-directed um, and she's self-paced the nice the nice thing about it is if you've got it and you're ready to move on then you move on it's not well we're gonna go over this again and again and again because 40 percent of the class didn't didn't get it or we're, we're struggling with this or we're going to dwell on this you know one of the other things in a traditional classroom is that you sort of spend more or less time on things depending on the interests of the teacher you know if the teachers really into Greek mythology you're gonna spend eight weeks on Greek mythology uh, if the teachers not then you're gonna cover the standards and move on so she has that flexibility really for herself to say these are the things I'm really interested in, in and I'm going to delve into them more and spend more time on them and do more pro projects related to those and really work to tie uh, my social studies class with my English class and and with my art history and really put pull those together into one experience um, where her interests lie so she has a lot more control over her own learning uh, one of the things we've been working on this first quarter has been scheduling her time and setting priorities and you know really working on some of those skills where she does take more of an active role in determining what she's doing from hour to hour during her day which is so cool. do you see this as a model that would work in, in scale all the way through getting her PhD or whatever she wants to get to or do you think there comes a point where she has to be challenged like you're saying with other peers saying you're, you know your ideas are dumb or your ideas are great <laughs> whatever I, it may be <laughs> I, I would like to see more interactivity with other students and more challenge, more challenges to her own thinking, um, requiring her to debate, for example, requiring her to speak. I think webcasting would be really good for her, you know, and just just arguing or or debating things with other students would be really valuable. So I'm I'm not crazy about the isolationist. I think she can learn online. I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, especially at this level where it's almost all content and and very little of it is actual skills development or critical thinking she gets her creativity and, and critical thinking in other ways um, so I, I don't know that that she's never going to be in a classroom again but this model seems to be working for her right now and and that's what the goal is get through have you been putting Chinese grade. paper locks on her lunch boxes again you know, the the rule is uh, she has to be dressed by the time Dad gets home from work. <laughs> so that's kind of like the rule around here. <laughs> yeah, really. Very similar. You take a shower. You don't Hi, Hi shower. Francis. Um, just to recap here, Francis is asking who is her. John is talking about his daughter, who is twelve. She's twelve. Yes, in seventh oh, grade, yes. and is nice job. He's doing a. Uh, uh, school in an online charter so she's home all the time doing school from home and what we're sort of exploring right now which is neat is the comparison between it's actually a really nice one because it's all happening in John's yeah. house um, <laughs> yeah taking a taking a MOOC for credit and having his daughter who is in um, an online charter school and let um, me get so back to the MOOC if... how are you doing in your MOOC John I'm struggling with the MOOC mostly because I'm struggling with MOOC so it's it's meta. Every time I start to reflect on the course content, I end up reflecting on the process of participating in the MOOC. And mm -hmm. I think that might be because this is the first time I've taken one seriously. You know, the first time I took an online course, um, I think I spent more time focused on the fact that it was an online course than on the subject matter of the course. And, and so that is something that comes with time. I'm participating in a pilot. Um, with the credit thing and and the reason I'm doing this is because I am in uh, a profession where I have certification from the state and I have to maintain that certification every five years I have to renew my license uh, my teaching license and to do that I have to have a certain amount of coursework and that coursework has to be coursework for which I've received credit from a university so 
I recognizing that most of my learning comes from my personal learning network and from people like the ones on this call and from reading blog posts and Twitter and, and all of those kinds of things, I went to uh, one of the guys at the local university and said, hey, how can I get credit for this idea? And I, I sent Dave's MOOC video and, and the links to uh, Change 11. And he said, that's a really good question because all of the courses that we offer, all the workshop courses, and we're not talking about degree programs or anything like that. It's just, you know, you take a workshop and you get, you know, you get an hour's credit or two hours credit for it. And so we, we developed this structure whereby we can award credit and satisfy the requirements of the Board of Regents and satisfy the university that actual work is happening and still give the learner enough uh, enough leeway to sort of design their own workshop or, or set their own goals. And so it's, it's really mu very much a, a learning process and working through it has been uh, kind of challenging. One of the requirements that they had that was non-negotiable was that we have to have a log of how much time I'm spending because everything they do in the university is based on the number of hours you spend. So if I don't have 30 hours of contact time with this coursework, then I can't get to credit hours, which is what, I, what I'm working on. Yeah, another another piece of that is a personal reflection. So as I'm going through readings, I'm jotting down notes and stuff, and you know, usually in text files, I keep Notepad open all the time and just jot some stuff down, and then pull that together into some sort of reflection or application, apply it to my own learning. Theoretically, I post those online, although that doesn't always happen. Um, and the other thing. It, that we really set as a goal for this is the development of a of a learning network for me or the expansion of a learning network in my case because I already have one in place but the idea of a MOOC is that the course extends beyond the course that it's not locked up in some uh, learning management system where you make all these connections with all these people and then they all go away when you lose you, and you lose access to them when when the course ends so one of the goals here is am I developing professional relationships with new people and interacting professionally with them online through this course material and then maintaining those relationships after the the participation of the course is over so and that's one that I'm, I'm struggling with because I haven't made a lot of connections yet with people that I don't already know so it's it's difficult for me scheduling wise uh, one of the things that I've noticed is participation in a MOOC is not like an online course where I take an online course and course contents posted on Sunday I'll log in on Sunday or Monday I'll go through whatever materials they have I'll post some reflections in uh, in the discussion forums and I like to be like the first one in there so I don't have to think of something new to say because whatever I say is the new thing and then check in later like Thursday or Friday and respond to what other people have posted and that's pretty much it. Um, in this kind of scenario uh, you're kind of so you should be interacting with people on a more regular basis so I really should be spending more time every day not you know, a block of time at the beginning and at the end of the week, but a little bit of time each day, and I'm having t trouble really getting that time and, and engaging with it. So it's still a learning process. One, one question I had, and I think Francis might be getting um, at this as well, is MOOCs can be a, a jungle. And um, one thing, whether you believe in it or not, I tend to, I think there's something to be said for guided practice, and that um, just reflecting is nice, but you can um, make poor <laughs> reflections and mm -hmm. maybe didn't um, get what you should have gotten out of what you're reading or what you're viewing or you, you actually have you're factually incorrect <laughs> some things so I, how how is that um, a piece of that I think is you're reading what other people are writing as well so theoretically I should be reading you know I don't know five or six different reflections blog posts whatever on uh, this topic each week and then you know perhaps commenting or perhaps not but getting a wider um, a wider perspective than just what I'm bringing to the table and what the presenter for the week is bringing and I'll, I'll use Dave's isn't Dave your thing is like how airplane planes stay in the air or something like that <laughs> like when you talk about content um, and so say this had been a MOOC about how to how an airplane works or something um, and again, there's probably more points you could say, you know, that's correct or that's not correct than um, 
whatever they're talking about in, in change 11 to 2011. So what would need to be layered into this, and I'm kind of tying this now back to the OERU, what would need to be layered in here to give you that guidance as you're practicing? Would you have to bring your own teacher? Would they have to supply a teacher? Would you have to find your own subject matter expert? Or what, what would it be? In terms of, of factual information and retention of that, is that, that what you mean? Well, I was just trying to make the distinction. Change 2011, it's hard to like say someone's answer is wrong <laughs> on a lot of right. the topics they are discussed. Right. You know, how should we set up an OER university? Well, you know, we all can come up with some pretty good ideas and maybe in, as they pan out, you know, some won't work and some will work. But if you're talking about how an airplane stays in the air, it's pretty clear cut. There's some ways that definitely won't work. <laughs> some, some ways that, that work. Um, I, 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 I reject that separation. I, you know, you're the one that I had that separation. Yeah, I know. That was two years ago, though. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> why do you reject it? And why do you it? not reject it? Because I think it's Could actually a good cover one. 2009? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was sorry, a long time ago. Um, he, he, there are some things that form the basis of any context. So there are ways in which we need to establish common languages. No doubt. Those are agreements. So, you know, we call that um, a table and not a chair because normally we use it with chairs in front of it, not because it's somehow magically different, right? And in every field you have that. So if you're talking about, we call them wings. They don't need to be called wings, but we might as well call them that because... So you, you make those does. agreements all the way. Everybody else does, right? So you make those agreements all the way through. There's no actual agreed upon way to build an airplane. Um, the new one that just came out, the 787, seems to be really great, and it's 20% better on gas and all the rest of this stuff. But each one of those little bits and pieces, there's there's all kinds of, well, should we do it that way? I don't know. Let's try it. Can, there's can a lot we of that stuff. Out of fiberglass? You know? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but okay, well, not... what if I was in the, in your cl airplane making class and I said, well, I wanted to send you an email, but instead of hitting the button and having it sent through the internet, I want my laptop to fly to you, so I'm going to stand on my balcony and I'm going to throw it <laughs> because I'm going to make it fly to you. I mean, we all know that's not going to work. <laughs> So how, you know... I, I agree. I mean, I'm not sure how that be... addresses the question. Well, Dave no, lives on saying... the sidewalk right under your balcony, Jen. No, I'm, just I'm saying there, there are some things that, you know, if, if you were my teacher teaching me how things fly, and I said, I'm, I'm going to send you an email by throwing my laptop to make it fly to you like a paper airplane, um, you know, there has to be a point when someone corrects that something's wrong with my <laughs> understanding of how things work. No, but I, I think I, I, if I understand the claim that you're making, you're saying that at the high end, you need somebody watching the way you make an airplane. Um, yeah, or just telling me no, I'm wrong. That does not that is not how that will, that because there's nobody who knows today. how to make. There, but okay, there's nobody so what, who knows how to make an airplane. Like there's no people who know how to make airplanes. That's not the way airplanes get made. What if this reflection piece is in public? So what if I post uh, a blog post on David Wiley's week like I did a couple days ago and that is out there you know in public so Dave can respond or any of the 2,000 other people who are taking this course can respond or David Wiley can respond and say you misunderstood what I said and so he can post a comment on my reflection and say this is not correct with what my assumptions are based on or what my my premise was for for what I was saying for this week. But then we get back to Francis's but, point, which is it's a, MOOCs can be a jungle and it's kind of a crapshoot whether someone will see your post and take the initiative to point the, out the error of your ways. Which is why we pay people to do that, which is where we're instructors, the role they fill, right? It, well, and that, that gets back to MOOCs for credit a little that, bit yeah, because that, we're which, sort of discussing question, like, what really? is the role of the credit uh, granting institution if they're not responsible for any of the course content and the student is responsible for all of the learning then what is this university doing for the you know two hundred dollars three hundred dollars per credit hour that you're gonna pay them besides and, saying and see, yeah they did it see I see them as responsible for that middle part and I think that's where the innovation in this whole thing is gonna come I, I think the open materials all right they're fairly standardized. The assessment will involve some adjustment from what's used now. But it's that role of an instructor or a class or a university to uh, 
help facilitate learning, to help the, to provide feedback uh, when the student is documenting their learning as you're having to do, John. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's a single answer to that. I think it could be a university class in an Illuminate. I think it could be one-on-one -on -one stuff. I could see a lot of people doing kind of a independent contractor uh, situation. I, I feel like there's some things we haven't, and I, I, I mean, I do see this kind of as a flipped classroom thing. You've got your, your content out there. How you do that second part of it, of an engage with the material is, you know, gonna take a lot of different forms. Yeah, I think there's a big difference between teaching a class and using OER as the resources for that class and creating your own class based on OER and trying to get some sort of acknowledgement of the work that you've done. Um, and, and I think the stuff with OERU, if I'm not mistaken, is is that first model where you're taking creating your, your own class essentially, as a learner? No. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. But o OERU is not doing that. They're taking the courses that the university already has and saying, how can you use OER to meet the requirements of this course or the objectives of this course and the way that we measure that is you come in and take the exam and whether you took the course or not if you can pass the exam you can get the credit. Um, I think that's very different from saying I want to invent my own course and somehow get credit for that. So then I guess we're saying or you're saying that you're the middle part um, while important doesn't necessarily matter as long as you pass the test. Well, I, that that was my take on this week. Right. On what, mine, what they're mine doing. Mine too. Mine too. And maybe because I've spent the last several years talking about how to design proper <laughs> instruction, <laughs> which we could divide. And had my you know, at least in the U.S., that's where we are with K twelve as well. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of hard pass for me to the, just gloss the over test, that part. If if all of our students can pass the test, then we're a great school. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I agree with you entirely, Jen, even if we come at it from slightly different perspectives. How you go about taking that stuff in your head to me is far more important than what you're taking into your head. Um, from a student perspective, I think that if you teach people to take stuff in and regurgitate it, you're doing very bad things to your culture. Um, and it may be that, as Jeff says, we end up with new innovative ways of doing that. And what you end up with is a swath of professional mentor guide people who get brought in at various times and people try the MOOC thing and they go, wow, this is so much harder on my own. I'm just going to pay somebody to help me through it and then we're back all the way around again, right? We're paying people to help us through the process but what we may have done on the way is broken down some of the habits that were mm -hmm. in the first model, the ones where, you know, it's accepted curriculum and you chunk it all up and you regurgitate it back where you're saying, wow, I, I should get Jeff Lebo to come in and talk to me about how to... Um, blog and <laughs> how not to blog. <laughs> that, I that way I don't have to figure it out for myself in that way you know, I think about the way that right now we're trying to um, we're trying to rethink the way that we do e-learning on campus and I actually have uh, very little to do with that discussion um, but in the ways in which I do they've learned um, <laughs> well it's never really been my role at the university um, but in the ways in which I am involved in it um, and the parts of it that I do do engage with, it's clear that the way the faculty wants to be trained is exactly like that. They want to have somebody who they can bring in, who can help them get to the places they need to get to when they need that to happen. They don't want to take a course that lasts eight weeks that's going to teach them how to do something. They want to be able to fit it in different ways. They want to have a mix and mash of tutorials that they can see online and they want to be pointed to those and then every once in a while they want to be able to bring somebody in who's going to help them solve those problems and I think maybe one of the most important pieces and this is something I've been realizing through and I mean Francis is right I, I, I'm taking too strong a, a point and I think Jen is as well but is somebody who can identify what I don't like the term but the wicked problems so when you look at a problem if you know that there's no accepted answer to it that makes your approach to it an awful lot easier, right? So if you look at um, something like environmentalism, or you look at a great example here in Canada, the gas line that's going to the states. They're trying to build this massive, I don't know, kajillion dollar gas line that's going to send eight gigantic buckets full of oil 
down to Texas, bitumen down to Texas. Well, there's environmental impacts, there's political impacts, there's social impacts, there's all the rest of these things. And there's no way you can look at it from one side and not end up with people who are diametrically opposed. It's, it's what their people like to call wicked problems. So in every field, those occur. You know, what's the right way to teach people how to do this? Well, there isn't really one. There's these 10, and people like different ones for different reasons. Just knowing which ones are like that and which ones have simple answers to them makes a big difference, I think. And, and that's where the guide is critical, right? Either you make the guide implicit in the content and you make all those decisions ahead of time, which I'm thinking is what they're doing in, in the course that... Um, in the classroom that J that John's daughter is in, all the decisions are made at the content creation level, right? So we're going to decide which one of these, or we're going to decide how it's presented, and then there's the instruction happens before you get the content, you know. Whereas, and, and I think that's what ends up happening to that middle ground. It gets shoved out to the content creation, so the student never understands that things are being negotiated, mm -hmm. right? And that's what worries me about the whole thing, about OER and all the rest of that stuff, is if you push the negotiation of the knowledge out to the, the, the and this is my problem with instructional design, the student should see the negotiation, not well, that's what, have it done That's what we've them. been doing with textbooks for the last hundred years, too. That's right. And I definitely want to get to Julia's question because I think it's awesome. Um, but I just wanted to say to John, and this is in no way being condescending, I'm just making an observation. What you described is exactly what the correspondence school model was before the days of the internet. And absolutely. so what absolutely cracks me up is how, um, you know, I guess what goes around comes around, but you've got on one hand, you've got social constructivists out there saying um, student-to-student -student interaction is more important than student-to-content and more important than student-to-teacher interaction yet at the same time we have these models that are building on these old 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 things we did that we also know worked quite well as far as being able to teach content but it's just, it's just kind of funny to me to hear you describe it because it pretty much is textbook <laughs> was done when back in the day but um, right. Julie's got a great question unless you want to respond to that that's, well that's not necessarily very different from what's happening in a middle school classroom either depending on which school you're in you know it, it's it's the same sort of thing with students interacting with content as opposed to students interacting with other students or with their teacher um, they just happen to be in the same room at the same time right and that whole middle section just to kind of put a bow nice pretty bow on that to me that the, the mix of student-to-student -student interaction, student-to-content, and student-to-teacher, figuring that all out, I think, is a subject certainly for many, many other days. But um, to me, that's really, I think, kind of the important part of the discussion that's being left out. But Julia is asking. So she, at her university, they're mounting 10 new online courses. I think Julia is a she. I must I don't think that's a stretch. She sure so. is. Um, and then one is a first-year calculus class. one six, Julia. Oh, okay. And the impulse is to create a whole new set of resources customized to it. And certainly we can point her to a lot of places. Um, and I think this gets to I think what Jeff, you were saying too, flip, flipping it. Like we've got the resources there, so let's spend more time on how we're going to actually teach the material, right? Yeah, and I also find, you know, this negotiation of content to be sort of an interesting issue. And I, I mean, I wonder how much that's part of the discussion. All right, you've got your materials at Khan Academy or at some archive of open content. But I, I think engaging with that content and remixing it, like, can you kind of try to get both birds with, with one course where, okay, you start with a certain public open content, but that it's engaged with, it's remixed, it's adapted. And so what comes out of the course is a slightly evolved version of this or customized version of this that others are free to take as a starting point if they wish. Yeah, I think there are two parts to that. I mean, Julia, she sure is, yeah. I know who you are. Um, the, the Khan Academy version of calculus, and I was just responding to her in the chat room, um, is that basic understand the context and the language of the field stuff, right? If you go through and you do the calculus exercises in the Khan Academy, you're going to be able to understand the words that people are used, and you're going to know what a differential equation is, and if you can pass all their tests, which are pretty simplistic, but if you can do enough to pass those tests, then you're going to understand 
what those words broadly mean probably that or you're tricking the test but you've gone through so much work to trick the test at that point that you've probably gotten some sense of what's going on at that point maybe you're ready to have the kind of conversation that Jeff is talking about where you're actually negotiating because calculus there's calculus but real calculus you know when I had a, a great presentation last year from a math prof who spent a whole bunch of time uh, hanging out with art profs and realized that there's this whole other end of math that she never taught inside of her undergraduate courses the the really magical part of math where you're really exploring the crazy things that you can do with it and how interesting it can be that part of calculus which is actually quite cool and I used to barely understand and don't remember at all but that part you'd be able to engage in after because it's that that first step right that OER is so so great at which is getting you to the point where you understand the basic language of any field that you can do with without a guide that's just about what's that word again what does that mean you know in philosophy it's like who's Hegel what did he say like you just you need to have those basics before you can engage in a conversation about the history of philosophy once you have them then the real learning begins you know okay so let's talk that then let's use your term I think you said basic language I was using the airplane thing well let's go let's say it's basic where you're saying it's just more facts right we're teaching facts and so we're pretty much saying okay we're gonna have a course correspondence school model <laughs> for facts Khan Academy is a correspondence school it's a fancy correspondence someone took the time to design exactly what content is needed and then there's a test to teach whether they understood that yeah. content um, you could do it paper and pencil and send it in you could walk it across the street and have someone grade it <laughs> there's just nothing sure magical could. about the internet so okay so we're making a distinction there um, so then are MOOCs better for the other stuff then because I would think a MOOC is probably not the most efficient way to do the Khan Academy stuff oh it's right? terrible yeah it's a terrible way I mean we can talk about our own field um, you know how many times did we do our basic introductory uh, ed tech talk where we said okay let's start at the beginning there's this software there's this and this and this and this and this because we ended up with people saying we don't know what you guys are talking about and while we're an open you know um, you know people can come and listen and talk and engage and all the rest of that stuff and if you don't know episode one if they want start over yeah. if they really yeah. yeah and if and if we had had the time and enthusiasm we could have gone out and said here's our you know 10 part OER course that essentially sketches out the the 10 basic things that you need to know to be involved in an ed tech community you want to start well here's the first one this is the one about blogging it talks about basic software it talks about tone and structure and comments and networks and then you have another one you have another one you never one. we could easily build that I mean actually we tried once <laughs> <laughs> um, and but after that you could engage in a MOOC on ed tech I don't think you could before if you had no it'd be tough it'd be really tough and I think yeah. a lot of people run into that where they think that they can just step into these open discussions and have a really great time I think there are some personalities that can um, but if you're not sort of willing to fail publicly um, it's really tough to, to start right in the middle of what is essentially a, you know a fledgling professional community has anywhere in this discussion the possibility of kind of building a community of courses that are a, a multi MOOC of some kind where you have the OERU resources and different universities are having their Calculus 101 courses and you have the facilitation and the remixing and negotiation of content within the context of a MOOC. So you have 20 different Calculus 101 courses participating in a MOOC to provide that level of engagement but you have the smaller scale uh, feedback and reflection process going on in a way that might allow learners to actually not so using a, using the framework of a MOOC to guide people through the OER on some sort of schedule so that they're all interacting with that content at the same time or same pace yeah I mean how many calculus 101 courses or writing 101 or whatever courses are starting in September in North America and if there's 20 of those courses that say, hey, we want to participate in this MOOC, then you've got a little bit of the best of both worlds, potentially. It's a fantastic idea. Um, logistically complex, um, but a really fantastic idea. I don't know that I would choose a one-on-one -on -one course for that, um, mm -hmm. but uh, how much fun would it be to take 
like a third year economics course or like a like a fourth year nursing class or something like that where you had people who were still students but had just gotten to the point where they're ready to really engage um, and you match them up all across. That'd be so much fun. And it brings in the social learning. Like, you know, because you've got your lunch table that you can sit at, but there's all those other lunch tables that you can meet people from those other universities and and branch out into the larger network. Yeah, that's cool. And, Sort and that out for us, would you, it's Jeff? A, no. It's a very good thing Jeff's a participant <laughs> because I think they'd love to hear that in two weeks in that uh, seminar that you signed up for. Do you even remember you signed up for that, by the way, Jeff? Yeah, it came up on one of our cool casts. John Graves is very involved in it. And I noticed one of the sponsoring universities is the university that I'm teaching an online course for in New Hampshire. And I thought, gee, that sounds maybe that interesting. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, but to get to your point, they also, on that PDF that I put in on page, I think it's on page 8, list all of the examples of courses that are currently being offered, and they certainly list MOOCs in there, but they're also like University of the People, which is kind of that idea where it's like, okay, we're going to be having basically a conversation around this topic, and um, the Sailor Foundation has been trying to do some of this uh, stuff as well. So people are trying. Um, but it's those three components we talked about, the content, the, kind of the instruction, and then the, the credit for the experience. Putting those three together, um, this seems to be one of the most ambitious I've seen, even though I think the middle piece, the Open Educational Resource University, even though the middle piece I think is a little squishy, um, I think they're at least trying. So we'll see what comes, comes of it in 2012. All right. Well, we hit our hour mark-ish, unless anyone else had anything else they wanted to chit-chat about. Um, yeah. I just want to um, maybe qu announce some of the Change 11 stuff coming up. We have Nancy White coming on at noon Eastern tomorrow. Um, Nancy White! <laughs> uh, who is like, one, you know, my favorite person on the internet. Um, and she is going to be doing her stuff. It's still not entirely clear what that's going to be. If you see the link she just posted on Twitter, uh, it's like, it's going to be fun. So I don't know what exactly it's going to be, but that's all good. She's fantastic. And then uh, next week, y'all get to fight with me because uh, next week's my week. Ah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that the week of the night? facilitating those sessions. Yeah, Which I'll facilitate right. them for You're myself. You're hosting and right. facilitating, yeah. Dave's fighting with himself. And I will mention that on this week's cool cast, which is Wednesday's 1400 GMT, figure it out. Uh, <laughs> I believe Tim Owen is going to be stopping by to share some of his thoughts on where's the change in Change 11. Ah, oh, very nice. Very oh, nice. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. We That came up again on Friday, and we, were, we had the same conclusion we had last year and the last time anybody brought this up. Uh, Jeff and I have been having the same argument for five years. It's too painful to constantly try to bring people into the audio. If other people want to meet and have a conversation on all the stuff that's going on, it's an open course. By all means, go ahead. Have smarter people talking about the issues. But if we get together for one hour a week and nobody else comes, that's cool. If people want to come, that's great. We interact with the chat room and stuff. But in terms of trying to get random people to get their headsets on and come in and say, can you check my audio when we can't hear you and that stuff, it's too painful. Well, beyond Unless random, you're your, your guest speaker uh, last week did a great job, great presentation, great slides, but he was uh, using uh, Wi-Fi in a hotel, I believe, <laughs> and kept cutting out. So you can't yeah. even get the guest speaker. Exactly. You can't exactly. imagine what's going to happen yep. as you yep. layer in more people. Yeah, and, and that's my response to that whole thing, right? You know what? Um, sure. Sometimes Stephen and George get off into some Stephen and George land where essentially they're just talking to each other because they've been having this discussion. It happened more in the connectivism course because that's something they both developed, you know, and it happens every once in a while. But still, like I say, there's lots of room on the Internet. You know, Are you guys, you guys still aiming to do the follow-up discussion on fantastic. Fridays? We did one last week. We're doing them all the time on Fridays. We're, we're going we're gonna to do them. We're not going to do them the way that, that Timmy Boy wants us to. Uh, which is what I was just explaining. I just can't have the massive collaborative stuff. So even for those, you're not bringing people in? No. No, you're okay. doing that. You're doing great. <laughs> but I'm saying it'd be like, <laughs> and it's not that hard. Uh, that's it. right. I mean, that's how a cool cast works. Hey, we're having this conversation. Exactly. Here's the Perfect. link. 
exactly. But I, but I'm not that interesting. I don't know stuff. You guys know stuff. You can People get want to talk to you to, to Why share don't stuff you though. Merge your shows, and Jeff can control the audio inputs, and Dave can control the conversation. But he's already doing such a great job. Why would we interrupt <laughs> his wonderfulness? <laughs> I, I, just I just think it's just it's not thought. as as difficult or impossible to manage as you're making it out to be. I mean, I, Dave, I think it's a valid choice. I think you can Jeff, say, hey, look. Jeff, I, I've done 350 live <laughs> sessions with you, buddy. I know exactly how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody other than, than you has done this more than I have. I mean, I find it painful. You well, apparently not. he's doing a better job than you are, Dave. <laughs> he I is. Think he's great at it. <laughs> I think Absolutely. we're learning something right he's now. He's patient with people. He just doesn't nobody, like having oh, no, to give up the microphone that much. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't quite That's hear your audio. Yeah. Can we just, let's just stop for a second. Can you try it? Can you try it? Well, look down in your bottom left-hand corner there. You see your little mic button? Yeah, click on the mic button. <laughs> You've done it a hundred times, and you're, you're as patient with everybody every time you do it, and I think it makes you a wonderful person. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes you different from me. But my point is, it's not as painful as it used to be. I mean, yeah, you still get some of that, but there's just so much more live interactive literacy than there used to be. That, you and know, it's and, all and going to the will... cool cast. And what, what's the date? What's the time for the cool cast again this week? Uh, Wednesday, 1400 GMT. For all Thank of you your help. live interactive, everybody participates needs, please come out to the cool cast at uh, 1400 GMT. It's there's right your there. solution. Is Dave, Dave going to be there? Solution. I hope so. And and Julia's going to be on at 4 p.m. tomorrow with Nancy White as well. Poor Nancy's getting uh, pulled all over the place tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. Oh, no. That's after your session. Yes, it is. What's, what's the platform, yeah, Julia? Is that DS-106? Is it going to be DS-106, yeah. Can people call in? Is it they it, better, Julia. You're on the spot now. <laughs> they better tell you. be. How much is it? Just one six time zone is this? ETLT. It's not that hard. It's not that hard, Julia. Let me tell you hard. right now. It's not that hard. <laughs> in fact, Julia, why do you Jeff, call I'll help in? you with it. Why isn't Julia <laughs> calling in right now? Because she doesn't have the let's, Google Plus hangout. Why hasn't Jeff already invited her is what I want to know. I am slacking. Why is he trying to control the conversation? He is. Can't get a word in edgewise with Jeff on. My goodness. Crazy. All right. I think it's time to wrap this up. <laughs> this is when it gets fun, though. <laughs> I can and just throw a little... Because you guys don't <laughs> stick around for post shows anymore. You're out of here. Oh. Because well, you're all bright-eyed and... That's true. Well, i got to go to work. in the morning over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but Daylight Savings happens next week, right? Uh, or it stops Sure. I've weekend. been wondering okay. about that. Shouldn't that be here already? Yeah, next weekend it happens. Next week. So okay. we stick with thanks. Thanks for keeping track of our own our clocks for us, Jeff. Yeah, you you North Americans are messed up with your clocks and your time zones. Uh, so we're staying at seven p.m. Eastern. Is that correct? Yes. If you're fine, unless you have some GMT thing thrown at us, so we have to go look up. No, that's it's awesome. I get too. to sleep another hour. He'll convert okay. it. Okay. So I'm going to be super awake next week. Hey, what's our okay. topic next week? He'll be late for work. I think the topic. We're talking about be tablets. On Tablets. Tablets. Thursday is when the day we decide our topic. How do you know what the week's going to hold until Thursday? Yeah. Yeah, All right. Thursday. It's a good point. Okay. Ta-ta for now. Thanks, Ta-ta for now. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Bye. Bye. Our topic can be Dave Prep. It's not that hard. Look She's at you. Gone already. <laughs> She's gone? Wow, she Not was in her head hard. Not that hard. <laughs> Daniel Linz, you apparently did have bandwidth on the island you weren't using. <laughs> so for your Friday things, do you use Illuminate or Hangout? Illuminate. That's too bad. I, I, I think there is a missed opportunity there for people to engage in the discussion. Because, I mean, you guys have nice conversations, but... So what you're saying is that we should be calling people into the show yeah, and getting their audio feedback so we can have a broader discussion. You know, if only there was a separate show that did that, say in the middle of the week. Well, then you guys should show up to CoolCast because I, I think it is nice to have people coming in, but I think they want to talk to the teachers. And you're saying CoolCast would be cooler if Dave were there? Sometimes. Coolcast would be cooler if George were You know, there. I mean, people want to engage. You know, it, it's you guys are the middle role. 
in the MOOC. You're the ones who are helping us process this content. And, and we're hoping that the actual facilitators are that middle role though, right? And you and the facilitators. I mean, okay. you're the one who hosts the conversations. You're the one who helps people engage mm -hmm. with the facilitators. And I think people want to say, oh, you know, Dave, in that question, you said, you know, you made this point. And mm -hmm. I, I think that is, I think people would like that. I think so. I mean, I, don't you, oh do you God, think there's really crazy. that big a difference between did you see my you saw my presentation on uh, on Tuesday right or at least you flipped through the video a little I think bit the first ten minutes that was good yeah okay so you said there was a live slide in that first ten minutes yeah mm -hmm. so in terms of interactivity from a room with forty five or fifty people in it do you honestly think you'd get more interaction if I allowed people to call in their questions than by reading them off the chat room and I don't off the see screen. it as calling in questions. I see inviting them into the conversation. It, it, yes, if it's a call in and ask your question and then step out, it's not worth it. But if it's bringing in different people into the conversation, when you see someone's blog post, and, and maybe, you know, maybe that's the concern, is the constant coming in and out. And that's not what happens on a cool cast. People gather and then slowly people will join as space permits. But if you guys see some blog post from the week and say, oh, you know, they had a really interesting point about this and an interesting question. Would you like to join us for this discussion? So it's really just bringing more participants into the conversation. And if you have space, say if you'd like to join, here's the link. Mute your microphone if you're giving us crap audio. Hmm. Or you can mute them. That's a nice thing about Google+. Plus. Yeah. And, and, and how is that so much more democratic than allowing... 30 people to be talking with questions in the chat room and interacting with those questions. Because I find you get through way more people's opinions if you pull them out of the chat room. And like, I'll talk directly to the chat room. I've spent 10, 15 minutes talking directly to a chat room and to a screen. Because then you have 15 different people talking, not one, not the, the chosen person who gets to come in and talk, who happens to have decent audio before you Jeff You still have them. that. You're just including more chosen people. <laughs> you're, you're just broadening the conversation. And you're giving people a chance to step into the big boys table yeah there's something to that I guess I don't think of myself that way which is why yeah I, I don't I don't they, see it that way at that. all but yeah no I see the point that you're making that is a point I, I okay um, uh, all right and I you know I'm more Jeff, than happy to this, help th this and, this week I will I will find one person and I will invite them in Ooh, who's the lucky? It's the Willy Wonka of Mook. I, I will, there will be a golden game. ticket. It's not going to be Jeff Lebo, I hope. But that's the other problem, right, Jeff? Like, what are the odds of me finding a person who's going to be able to make it? And then all of a sudden, I've spent two hours of my week trying to track someone down to get them to come in. This is why we don't prep for our tech talks, right? Right now, tweet, hey, talking to Nancy White, or follow-up discussion on Friday. If you're interested in joining, let me know. Send us a cool blog post so I can see whether or not you're smart. No. Just if you you know, invite them in, and if they're if they're you know a ridiculous point maker, whatever, deal with it. Chances are you're not going to get that. Francis Bell's calling us fat. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Francis. Not to mention the it yes, is I agree, dominated. Jess, um... Jeff's Minister. usage of the term big boys was very sexist. I agree with you entirely. Well, mm -hmm. in this case, it's applicable. There's no girls at the table. You, who's being sexist now? Again, we never really thought of ourselves as particularly dri driving this course. We worked really hard to get a representative group. Masculine open online courses. Hello and welcome to the MOOC. <laughs> All right, on that note. See why we don't do post shows? <laughs> I know. I wish I knew which why not, Francis Bell. <laughs> why am I not fat? I don't know. I don't know which why not she's saying. Why did you not see yourselves as leading the course? Why aren't there women? <laughs> I, always, I agree. I always enjoy the post show more. It's just too bad Jen ran away. I don't. I don't think that... Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I've got a rubric. The rubric is simple. It's a hundred percent. It's all in one box, and it is. Did Dave like it? There's my rubric. <laughs> yeah, it's just one giant box. Actually, plus ten bonus points if I laugh out loud. Um, I mean, in terms of the choice of me, Stephen, and George, I don't know how that happened. We've been working together. Stephen and George founded Connectivism and they called me or I invited myself. I'm not sure how that worked in 2008. And the three of us have just been working together since. I don't think that... Uh, why would I say big boys? I did not. Jeff said big boys. Um, that's a good question. Because, I don't know why well, he said that. Well, because the three of you are facilitating boys? this course, people see you as the instructors for this course. And so if you are participating in an event then it's an official Change 11 MOOC event. Whereas if Jeff's just doing this uh, cool cast on Wednesdays, because you're not there, it's not an official blessed thing. So it has less credibility. Despite the way you want it to be. But wouldn't it make more sense to invite Nancy, like Julia's done? Like the, the whole concept yeah. this time around, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we didn't create, we didn't control the curriculum. All we did is we reached out to people from all over the world, all the people we could find, the people that we knew, the people who would say yes, because a lot of people said no. Um, and so a lot of people didn't know what the hell we were talking about. Um, but anyway, we asked a lot of people. Nancy's not and coming on Friday? I don't know if she can make it. She's going to be traveling Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, I don't know how Julia got a time with her tomorrow that worked out because we ended up going back and forth and back and forth and finally found a time that would work. That's the problem. I mean, these people are all crazy busy people. You know, Nancy's on the road all the time. Um, and so I don't know if she's going to be able to make it on Sunday or on Friday. I mean, it's just, it's what we've decided is that for the Friday sessions, we're going to have them at a time. We're not going to negotiated or anything else we're just gonna pick a time because we've been having a really hard time getting the schedule together because you know we've it was bad enough when it was Stephen George and I being busy but Stephen George and I add a facilitator who has got a life and you know with with Martin we uh, like Martin is George's thesis advisor so that wasn't too hard because they talk to each other all the time anyway but with somebody like David Wiley um, is tough you know, to, to get hold of him and well, to work I would, out I would times vote, and stuff. I mean, I know and, scheduling is a challenge, but I would come up with a few different time slots that you guys, or two out of their three are available. And I think it would be nice to have the facilitator. And I also think it would be nice to mix up the time zones a bit uh, or the time structures because there are some of us who, you know, are just not... You know. How many hours do you teach a week, Jeff? Uh, right now I'm teaching 22. There's, there's no way. Make excuses to do something, not to do something. Not to not do something. <laughs> uh, and I'm totally cool uh, getting rid of big boys for big humans or head honchos or big kahunas or whatever uh, uh, would be more appropriate. Dave apparently left mm -hmm. and has returned. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. It didn't look like he had ever gone. Maybe he. Wow, yeah, we got double days. If you didn't like me, you didn't Hi, need to. You could have just said you could have muted me instead of kicking me out. <laughs> You're still there. Wow. No, no, that twice. one crashed. We had you twice for a minute. Oh, Google reloaded for for some reason. All my Google Windows reloaded at the same time. Uh yeah. There's just no way we can we can do the split times like. With the three-hour differential out to George, and you know we talked about it, and essentially we're scheduling the main speaking event for any time we can nail down the speaker. Whenever this, we did one on Sunday, we did one whenever we can get them, we're nailing them down. After that, with the Friday session, it's harder to keep changing the times and expect people to fit it in their schedule than it is to say for George and Steve and I to say, look, we're going to take noon Eastern for the next seven weeks and put it in our calendar and then it's done because that's we tried to negotiate it the first few weeks and we end up missing two of them and George's on a plane and all right I'll let you have that one 
we have a MOOC cast. Why do we need all this stuff anyway? It's a cool the, cast. Whatever, cool cast. The, 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 the internet is providing all the things that we need. We've got Julia doing it on, on Monday afternoon and you doing the other one on Wednesday. I think it's perfect. And it is your choice to it's think done. as such. It's done. All right, I need to go. <laughs> Have fun at work. Bye. Have a good week. Talk to you all soon. Bye.